That was an amazing performance, right? <laughs> Woo! I was floating too. <laughs> so the first thing I wanted to ask about was the actual instruments. I know this is a little bit nerdy, but I'm just gonna get into it with, uh, hopefully we can just kind of look at stuff. Maybe we can even hold some things up. So, um, Don't touch anything. I won't touch a thing. So, Cecile, can you tell us a little bit about your instrumentation and the different things that you're using? Yeah, I'm so tired of it. Maybe I'm going to drop something, so I should be careful. Okay. It's safer. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, an instrument from the, uh, tre uh, from the viola da gamba family. Uh, this is a treble viola. Usually the violas that people get to see are a bass viola, so much, much bigger, kind of like the size of a cello. I, I have one, and you can, if some of you have some of my older records, uh, you can hear it on Les Ondes Silencieuses and also um, on The Weighing of the Heart. Uh, so basically the, the difference, I mean, even though this is a treble, this is the treble mo model, it's basically more or less the same, um, the same principle. So the, it's earlier than the uh, cello, and the differences are uh, in terms of the, well, first of all, you can see that it's quite a, a thick instrument. Also, the interesting thing in terms of um, making is that it's not standardized, uh, like for instance, the string quartet instruments. Instruments, they, you know, they're fairly standardized, uh, whereas, you have like loads of different models of um, of violas, and so usually they're uh, they're thicker, as you can see. Uh, they have uh, sloping shoulders, and the I guess the biggest difference is that the strings are made of gut. So the um, is it these three are um, just the uh, sheep gut, and these these other three it's gut and it's wound with metal. Um, the bass viola that I have has seven strings, which is a French invention, it's true. Mm -hmm. uh, this one has only six. Uh, the thing about this one is that um, like normally uh, you would only play it in a con consort, like an, uh, an ensemble of uh, players. Um, when I got it, uh, might as well go into that. Yeah, I was going to ask, well, could you tell us, first off, I know this is a old, I mean, not this one particularly, because you mentioned, but it's a very old instrument. And is it played very much anymore, or? Well, I mean, I guess the Baroque music scene is thriving. Mm -hmm. I okay. mean, at least in Europe, I know that, you know, there are more and more people, uh, like, picking up the old repertoire and trying to find ways of um, playing the, the music. Well, they're trying to imagine what it sounded, really sounded like then at the time. Uh, yeah, this instrument is recent. Uh, I got it made by a French luthier. And the great thing about this guy is he wasn't born in a luthier family, which is usually the case, I guess, with most uh, luthiers. He used to be a traveling salesman sell selling house paint, and then he got made redundant. And, uh, and it, he kept complaining at home, and his wife said, yeah, okay, just stop it. What do you really want to do? And he was into, uh, he had been playing the cello when he was younger. He was into making guitars. And he said, I, I want to make violas. And, and the difficulty he had was uh, he couldn't find anyone who was willing to take him on as an apprentice. So he just started making violas in his garage. By himself. By wow. himself. And after three years of bringing his uh, models to uh, a music fair, which is held every year in Paris, he found a luthier who said, yeah, actually what you're doing is really, is it's good, so I'm taking you on as an apprentice. Wow. So I think actually, I mean, I love stories of, uh, you know, like people who become something they're not supposed to be. And I'm actually really happy that I bought two violas from someone who, you know, wasn't meant to be a viola maker. And uh, I think this person like makes really good instruments because, sorry, I'm just talking so much, but there is so much to say actually about this whole thing. Um, like now you find Chinese models, um, like really cheap. And so some French luthiers, they're trying to adapt to the market by making, you know, I don't know if you say entry point, uh, you know, like when you have a- Like a beginning level. Yeah. So, um, so I, I paid a little bit more for this, but I do think that, uh, Actually, if you use an instrument in an unusual way, it really pays to have a better instrument. 
uh, I mean, we're not talking crazy prices as in, you know, people who have uh, like incredibly expensive instruments, but I think that the, the better the instrument, the more um, room it leaves you to to just play differently. So this one, it's tuned differently, uh, same intervals as in a guitar. Uh, well, there's a pickup, which I recycled from a, a cello. It's a shirtless pickup. This is very exploratorium looking right here. Oh, like no, this. this looks awful, actually. No, but, uh, <laughs> no that's good here. It, in, that, in here, <laughs> that's really good. We make stuff. You no. Know, so. um, <laughs> I don't know why. This, makes, this white bit here makes me think of a Santa Claus kind of a beard. Anyway, um, <laughs> what yeah, else so do we have uh, back here, Colleen? Maybe you can show us some of the other. You had a, <coughs> is it a melodia? Melodica. 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 Yes. Uh, yeah, well, m the melodica, I mean, usually associated with kind of like childlike music, let's say. But I, I really love it. I think it. I mean, obviously, uh, if some of you are into Jamaican music, you will know Augustus Pablo, who uh, is one of the few people, possibly the only one, who really like took the instrument seriously, and he made like really, uh, you know, dazzling flourishes on the mm. melodica and. Uh, it was beautiful when you played it. Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm not sure. Again, what? you can see that I, I put these little things in order to minimize right. fuck ups. Uh, <laughs> Please sit. Um, one of the things I kept thinking about when you were playing, please sit down, um, was that you seem to have this great mix of electronic and acoustic happening. And I, and then, and then I, of course, thought about all the people I've seen who put all their loops into a computer, mm -hmm. and you're doing it all live. Is that I'm, I'm assuming that's intentional. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, actually, I hate it. Sometimes, you know, uh, after concerts, th there will be someone coming. Like, I haven't asked for their advice, but they will give me their <laughs> advice. And they'll be like, oh, why don't you get this synchronized with a computer? What you need is... I'm thinking, yeah, don't tell me what I need. I mean, so I know that some people are into um, really clean sounds. Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying that I'm into uh, intentionally... Um, inaccurate stuff and actually part of the difficulty of, of uh, playing live this way is that you yeah you can totally um, play a little bit too fast which has happened during this show also I think because I'm kind of out of sync right. because time of the jet lag yeah. so you yeah. know your perceptions of time change but um, I just really like this uh, just old school idea of uh, you know you just have some pedals you just you know, put them in a chain, which does require some thinking because actually the way they are put in the chain, it took me several years to arrive at that particular setup. Uh, and then I, I think I can mention there is a... Um, God. Okay, I was going to move. Really on. heavy. Um, all my pedals, I'm, I'm, so I'm not an al analog purist, although, you know, if I had loads of money, I would probably have lots of analog gear, but... Um, so the the pedals that I have, I mean, I don't know if you can, can move this. this. Yeah, okay. There we go. So the main looping pedal is the one that everyone has. Like um, earlier, I was doing an interview with um, uh, KLX, and the person interviewing me said, uh, oh, "Oh, at one point you stopped looping," and I said, uh, "Yeah, I think it was. I was a bit tired about it, but then." Also, I was appalled one day, I was uh, on YouTube, and I think I was looking for uh, something about the loop station, and I found out that there are like thousands of videos of people in their bedrooms doing whatever <laughs> with, with the loop station. And I thought, oh my God, this had become like a global trend, and I ha didn't even know it, and I saw they have competitions. You're As trending. No, but it, it <laughs> no, but I was... Um, like I knew it was popular, but on that day I thought, oh my god, it really is so popular that it's really cheap, you know, like it's really tacky. But then I changed my mind. I thought, no, actually, uh, nothing is, uh, even though something may become fashionable, it all depends, uh, you know, what you... How you'd use it. Yeah, and what yeah. you put, the actual sounds that you use. But so, uh, 
So that's the ubiquit ubiquitous uh, loop station RC30 uh, model, which is like the um, the second one that they've made. So it's got two tracks, so you can um, you're not bored by these technical details. This no? boring, um, no? Okay. Are you going to steal all my <laughs> ideas? Yeah. <laughs> they they oh like it. They like God. it over there. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So the good thing about this is that. Um, because you have two tracks, you can uh, actually, uh, for instance, if I take uh, the second song that I played called I'm Kin, first, first loop goes into this track, sorry. <coughs> and then I want to add the bass line, and I know that later on in the song I will need to stop the bass line, so the bass line I recorded in the second track, and then by you know pressing the pedal you get to choose between the which which is which uh, which one you're acting on? So it requires a bit of um, awareness and uh, preparation, but it's actually uh, really good. And then I have these two pedals, which I really love. The green pedals, uh, DL4 uh, by Line Six. It's a delay modeler, but it's also uh, another sampling pedal. And the sampling that it does is a bit different. It's shorter, so you. That means you have some limitations, but the good thing is you can speed up or speed down. Uh, no, not speed down. Slow down. Thank you. Speed up or slow down the sound as if it were, you know, uh, on a tape machine. So that's actually uh, I used it several times during the show, and the delays. Uh, they're emulations of uh, old uh, tape and um, tube delays. So you get a pretty. You know, authentic sound without having, you know, having to know how to operate it, a real tape delay, or you know, having to repair it when it falls, you know, when it breaks. Or this is just a reverb, so it's not very interesting. And then the pedal I wanted to mention in particular is is this one. It's, it's so that's the only real analog piece of gear I have in the setup. And it's uh, it was developed by Bob Moog. It's called the Mooga Fuga, and that's the delay. And uh, um, I got it initially. Well, anyway, sorry, I'm talking too much. <laughs> well, okay. anyway, it's it's really brilliant. Um, it does things that are because it's analog. It really is a different beast to uh, the other types of delay that you would um, usually get. I have to say. Uh, I can see that I love my emulations of delays, but this is very different. It's got a different grain, and then you barely touch it, and it really reacts, and it creates all these little artifacts. Um, so it's just a really uh, amazing piece of gear. I think what was striking to me was watching you. It was so great to get to see you perform after listening to your music, you know, uh, and it. It looks so simple what you're doing from you know sitting back in the audience, mm -hmm. but it's so complex what's happening. It sounds so complex. So it was this really great pairing, I think. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> it looks simple. I'm sure it isn't simple I, actually. Well, I hope <laughs> it looks simple because <laughs> I guess that's when things look simple, it's a good sign. With ease, yes, yeah. yeah. So um, you're on a tour. You're just starting mm -hmm. here, and where are you heading for? This is your cap, the captain of none record. Yeah, uh, Seattle. Then I play a tiny show in a place called Sea View, uh, but it's a special kind of show. Like normally, I don't do. Um, well, anyway, I'm not going to go into the details, but it's mainly uh, so Seattle, um, Portland, uh, Chicago, uh, New York. Um, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and Philadelphia, and then it's back home. Back home. Good. Well, that's exciting. I heard that while you've been here in San Francisco, you did some bird watching yeah, yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> and I was thinking that was pretty With great. Incredible weather. Thanks for yeah. the weather. <laughs> you got the one day of rain in the yeah, last I know, two I know. years. Were you looking for anything? You can thank me for uh, stopping that draft. <laughs> <laughs> Were you looking for anything in particular? D what kind of birds do you like to look for? Or do you have well, the list? Do you have the life list and all of that? Uh, That's what some bird wa watchers say, mm, I think. Well, I haven't started on that type of list, but I do have 
Um, I do have several Word documents that I have. One I call the bird watching journal. I put the important stuff that I've seen on a specific outing. And then I have a bird list. And the thing is, uh, it takes me forever to update it because, so I'm French. I live with a half Italian, half Spanish guy in Spain. And my bird guide is in English. And usually I follow blogs that are written in Spanish. So really, wow. when I see a new bird, like ideally, I need to uh, know its name in all the languages. So it takes me forever. <laughs> I do this like search for a three names but, per yeah, bird. Um, yeah, yeah. The bird watching thing. Um, it sounds like it has nothing to do with music, but um, well, I do. I do. Uh, I do think. Uh, it really helps me, like being out in nature, it really helps me to um, disconnect from like some work things that are not related to, um, to music. And... Um, I was thinking mm. about it because I was imagining that playing takes a certain kind of patience and mm. bird watching definitely yeah. takes a lot of patience because you have to sort of wait and yeah. spend that time observing and noticing and yeah i don't know what <laughs> i don't know what else to say <laughs> but uh, anyway okay. uh, i haven't answered your question well so yeah i was wondering I what birds you were looking for yeah, i'm sure for. you're all dying to know what kind of <laughs> birds i love uh, i love raptors uh, birds of prey and i also love uh, waders you know, the uh, shorebirds. And uh, I also love uh, thrushes. And uh, yeah, yesterday was just amazing for me. Like uh, lots of uh, pelicans. I fell in love with the pelicans, oh, the pelicans yesterday. Yes. Yeah, really amazing. They're like prehistoric looking, aren't they? Mm. We, can, we watch them a lot yeah. from the pier here. Um, well, I th thought I would ask a little bit about your records, because they're all really different from mm -hmm. my listening. And I was wondering if how your musical trajectory came about, you know, naturally over time, or, you know, did you start from a classical training? I'm not no. sure about your background, so no, I No, I don't have any classical training. Okay. I'm, um, I think I did love music as a child. Actually, I had uh, one of these, you know, Bon Tempi organs. Did they reach the States? No. Are they finger organs or? Bon, bon Tempi, uh, well, it's just a brand of uh, like, you know, organs for children. Mm. Uh, I had one of these when I was uh, seven, I think, because uh, one of my cousins got one, I so I wanted one. Uh, and then I uh, I just played the recorder, you know, in mus in um, in school. And I, I'm sorry, uh, I th actually, I think Jeffrey's mom, I don't know if she's still here. She yeah, you, you're apologizing <laughs> for on behalf of all the children of the world who, who have been made to play recorder in music uh, <laughs> class. And so they hated music, yeah. <laughs> no, anyway, so no, I mean, it's like no one in my family makes music. Mm. Uh, the few things we did in school, it was just appalling. Uh, oh, yeah, um, listen to that. We were made to sing Blowing in the Wind in French. <laughs> that That really is... You know, seriously. So, um, um, yeah, so no, it took the Beatles to, um, to really awaken me to uh, listening to music as a, you know, not as a child, just as a, I guess, you know, you know that step when you're maybe, you're into music as a child, but then you become a teenager and maybe mm. that's when you start listening to uh, a band for the first time yeah. and it, uh, and then, Two years later, I was uh, on holiday with my parents in Copenhagen. Uh, well, we were going through Copenhagen, and two guys were playing uh, Beatles cover versions on the guitar. And because I wasn't exposed to live music, I think that was the first time that I, I saw someone playing. And I thought, oh, I want to do that. So I, I begged my parents to buy me a guitar, a classical guitar, and that's how it started. Wow, that's great. Um, so do you... Um do you ever get, uh, or are you someone who likes to collaborate with other musicians, or do you like to? You're very insular. No, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm I was just sound curious. No, I mean, because I had, I didn't see anything when I was sort of. Yeah, reading about I did it. a few, a few things. Uh, usually, it comes through friendship, obviously an appreciation of uh, what someone does, but 
Uh, but I, uh, ever since I was a child, I was never into doing things with um, other people in terms of, uh, you know, like, uh, like for instance, in French schools, we have to um, do these like small presentations on books. And usually everyone in your, the class is like wanting at least one other person to do the presentation with because they don't want to work. Or, and I was the only one. I always wanted to do it alone. So I think it's really something that's been it's in me. In your character. Yeah. 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 Huh. Well, um, let's open it up to the audience. Do yeah. you sing? Yeah. Does anybody have any questions for Cecile? I know you do. You're out there. I see you. There's a gentleman there in the back. Um, I hope that um, one of your records gets sold to a car company and you make <laughs> lots of money. <laughs> um, I think that would be wonderful. What I actually, along those lines though, um, your music um, is, it feels very, and I, maybe I'm projecting, but it feels very personally yours. Mm -hmm. Like I, I feel like it, it is a very direct communication of your own musical world. And I'm wondering if your music has been used by other people, maybe in the theater or something yeah. like that, and how that felt for you, or how, or mm -hmm. if you've collaborated with people in that sort of context. Well, I partly, uh, like I make a living mostly out of uh, what's called sync licensing. Uh, which wasn't something I expected when I started making music. I didn't think that anyone would particularly pick up on it as a kind of a thing for illustrating other works. But I've been very lucky in that respect because it means um, I don't, I never create anything for anyone. So it's like everything is like, for me, my albums are the most important thing. That's also why I don't really collaborate. Also because I don't think I mean, to be realistic, I don't think an artist has like 10,000 IDs in their life. So I think if you start collaborating a lot, then the, there's a danger of spreading yourself too thin. So yeah, so that it's been used in films and you know, feature length, short films, dance, uh, theater, and a couple of like uh, artistic installations, that kind of thing. So uh, apparently, at least the instrumental music was really uh, speaking to certain people when they were wanting to illustrate. Since I've started singing, uh, I can see that for my finances it's probably a mixed blessing because I think music with lyrics, it's maybe not as malleable, uh, you know, to illustrate stuff. But you know, I have no regrets. I think uh, that car commercial is going to come anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions out there? One more here. Uh, sort of a uh, two separate questions. Uh, you mentioned installations. I, uh, will those sort of non-album tracks be ever ever be made available uh, commercially? Uh, you, you mean things, a bit I've, but I've never, um, well actually yeah, I did make music for one dance performance once and for a, a medium length uh, art film. But the thing is, I think they make sense, you know, with the visuals that they're created for. Uh, and to be honest, even though, you know, I'm not ashamed at all of what I did, I do think that somehow I tend to keep the best ideas for myself. I think, I don't know, maybe it's just a natural thing that without even, I don't know, without even wanting it, you keep the best for yourself. I mean, I think that's what happens. So, like for me, the. Like the, the important stuff is the albums, definitely. And speaking of the albums, um, why are the Spanish albums so much happier than your, the, your previous three albums? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, why, uh, okay, I know what you mean. It's kind of hard to answer. I think uh, one of the things about getting older, it's quite amazing how, on the one hand, some of your tastes, um, don't change, like uh, I still love the Beatles, for instance. I guess out of, the, uh, out of the things that I loved at age 13, there's probably not that many left that I would <laughs> still love today. Um, and then I, I don't know about you in the audience, if that's happened to you, if you're kind of my age. But uh, like I think as a teenager and as a younger person, uh, I was attracted to darker things. And as I get older, uh, first of all, I find them less aesthetically interesting, at least to me. 
but also I get too um, like I get too sad. Like for instance, before I could read uh, I don't know like maybe books about let's say you know concentration camps. Or uh, I had a phase as a teenager, I was really into the Vietnam War, actually, and uh, it was a subject that interested me for many years. And I was able to watch, you know, documentaries with, mm. uh, yeah, horrible things. Mm. And it's like, now I can't, because I, it gets to me too much. So I don't know if maybe that's part of the um, a process of uh, going towards, you know, uh, something with more light in it than something dark, although I think also uh, the notion of something sounding happy or dark, it's very relative, I guess. But, uh, and then, and yeah, and then in general, I just, like now I, like I live in Spain and I would never, I'm hoping I will, I will never go back to a place further up north. And like I was saying, um, like spending time in nature is really important. I. Also, bird watching makes you really look up in the mm, sky a does, lot, yeah. and it's just um, I think it's probably part of a like a whole uh, way of trying to be that probably subsequently gets incorporated, um, you know, into the music making. I guess. Any other questions out there? Okay, let's take these last couple in the back here. Uh, yeah, I was curious, being primarily a solo artist, um, if there's any instruments that you particularly admire that you don't play that you would like to incorporate sounds from or, or learn how to play in the future? In, in the future. Yeah. You stole uh, my question. That was going to be my last question. Uh, oh, well. I think I've kind of come down on the, uh, you know, buying instruments and trying to play everything. I had a period when... Um, like I was really into going to music museums in Europe and uh, buying the guides and like daydreaming about and having a harpsichord, like kind of crazy stuff. And then um, because I took a break from making music, I think that was a way of, uh, you know, like you start looking at, you know, in your house and you're thinking, well, I've got all these instruments. I'm not even, you know, I'm not even playing them correctly. I'm not even, some of them, they haven't been out of their cases for, you know, months, years, which is something that I find really sad. And an instrument that is not played, I find that really depressing. So um, I think now um, with the viola, I feel like I really found a very special instrument. And I don't know in the future what I'm going to do exactly, but I doubt that it will be with an instrument that I don't have now. I think I have like a lot of instruments I have at home that I can explore. Yeah. Uh, gentlemen, all the way in the back there. Do you have a microphone for him? There we go. This kind of ties in with the last question about instruments, mm -hmm. of the fact that you're using, that you're singing now and using your voice as an instrument and adding lyrics to your music. Um, so what is it that informed that? Like you're, you're writing a, did the lyrics come first? Did the music come first? And suddenly you just felt this, there's, there's words that need, specific words that need to accompany this melody or this song. What, what caused that to, to occur? Uh, you, so it's two questions. Why I started singing in the first place and then the process of how I write? Yeah, yeah. pretty much. Um, well, uh, when I had this break, which didn't last long, it was mostly in 2009, I really uh, had to stop making music for a bit. And um, I quickly recovered the desire to make music again, but I, I was really tired with the way I was working uh, pre previously. Um, and so I, I had to kind of uh, look look deeper inside myself and think, okay, what what is it that could really excite you now in terms of uh, you know making music again and i realized that i had listened to sung music all my life like the the beatles you know yeah. and um and i also just you know felt a desire uh, what what is it like to to sing um so it took me a long time to find out how to sing for my voice um but now it feels like uh it feels 
I can't believe I wasn't singing before. Yeah, it although seems so I have, natural to you. Mm, although I I don't make a, a hierarchic distinction between instrumental and sung, and actually that's I mean. You're American, so I'm going to mention him. I think Arthur Russell is like a big influence for me, mm -hmm. um, because I think he's like the epitome of, you know, someone who was just doing what he wanted to do. Uh, you know, he made music that's like a prototype of dance. He, but with a cello, um, I I really look up to uh, an artist like that. You know, for just showing that. There is really no real barriers between genres and even between instrument and voice. Uh, to answer the second part of your question, um, the th uh, this new album it it almost it has a concept of uh, of the human experience. So I knew when I was uh, starting to work on it that this would be what the lyrics would focus on. Um, and some of the uh, the second song, I'm Kin, that was, for instance, a song I knew what I wanted to express. So I wanted to say, uh, yes, I'm me, but I'm connected to all the cultures. I'm conne connected to animals. I'm connect connected to nature and the elements. So that was almost like a like I had this concept, and I was basically, you know, trying to write, and I just kept what felt the most relevant and least cliche because it wasn't <laughs> easy to to write so sometimes it's like that but most of the time it's just starting to make music and then starting ah, something like this you know with no lyrics and then trying to see what do i want this song to be about do i have something already written that could fit should i think about something else um, it's very flexible. I have no hard and fast rule uh, about it. I think we had one more question over here. Gentleman in the green shirt there. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm a recording engineer, and I work with a lot of artists that struggle with how to translate what we do in the studio to what they do on the stage. Uh -huh. And it was really interesting hearing you talk about your process with live looping and all the delay manipulation happening live as a performance. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how your recording process compares. Mm. Well, the thing is, with this new album, um, uh, half of the songs were uh, born during rehearsals for the last tour. So basically, I had more or less this setup of pedals in my studio. And the songs... Um, they, they happened at a moment when I was like falling in love again with the idea of, of looping. So in a way, it's made my job of translating the album to the live uh, setting much easier because in a way they were almost born to be, um, sorry, I was gonna say born to be alive, sorry. Do you know that song? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's late uh, for you. <laughs> wow. Um, <laughs> um, it's French guy as well, I think, Patrick Hernandez. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, that made that's why tonight I was able to play almost all of my uh, my album except one track, which is called Eclipse, which I really love, but I would need like uh, to be an octopus to perform it. So um, yeah, uh, th the thing is, I did have uh, it wasn't the same for the previous albums either because there were too many instruments or just and at the time mostly I just made uh, new songs for the live shows, and I. I never saw it as problematic, and I don't think my audience minded either. Although I'm very happy to be playing um, the album almost as it is. Actually, I kept the track listing as it is. At first, I thought, oh no, I, I can't do that. I can't play the songs in the order of the album. And then I thought, yeah, but the, um, the songs on the album are track listed in a way that makes sense. So it's also going to make sense in a live setting. So. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but uh, uh, yeah, it, it it does. Except for, um, it just seems that the way you're building songs on a stage is it's so much about what's happening in the moment on stage, mm. and I guess maybe it's less about the recording process and more about the writing process for you. Is it done the same way, and do you end up recording the songs in the same way as you perform them for us? Uh, I'm I'm not sure I understood that. 
Uh, I guess, are you writing in a way where you're recording as you're writing and building things up in the same way that you're building songs layer by layer on stage? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, basically, I spend just a lot of time in the studio just trying things. And uh, if I like something, I will immediately record it and take notes on a kind of a tablature kind of thing. Because it's incredible how, like, often what sounds the best is something that just comes in the moment and I don't even realize what my fingers are doing. So I think it's really important to always have something to record the ID as soon as it's out of your hands. And um, then I usually come back to it as the days go by. And if it stays interesting, I will keep working on it. Um, there's no... Um, yeah, there is no... I have no real method of doing things. I. I think it's really a question of spending, t I think, whatever you do in life, I think it's the question of um, uh, just spending the time doing it, and just doing it and doing it, and uh, something happens eventually, so. I think that's a pretty good note to end on. Our founder actually felt the same way, so the Exploratorium was built on a similar principle. Mm -hmm. Spend the time doing the thing you love. So, will everybody please join me and thank Colleen for coming? Thank you. We're so thank you. pleased to have her. Thank you all for coming too.